Hello there, in this video, we'll be taking a look at Dawn of War 2 Retribution and I'll be providing some thoughts, commentary and a general summary of the campaign. I'd already decided I'd play as one of the not evil factions if such a thing exists in Warhammer 40k, because I just played a Warhammer campaign in Total War as Chaos. The game starts with this extremely low frame rate for some reason cutscene, basically explaining the various Warhammer factions are fighting each other, really nothing much is happening in the plot, and you can see I've already made a mistake actually. The plot is from the perspective of the Space Marines, and if you don't pick the Space Marines, well, that's just the end of your plot experience basically, so this very much is a game with six campaigns, but really it's the Space Marine plot campaign, and five other campaigns that share surprisingly a lot of the Space Marine plot using some various contrivances as an excuse for them to not make any more stages or plot elements unique to the various factions, I think. It's a bit of a cop-out this game, at least that's what it appears to be, I've only played as Eldar. I feel like when this game came out, like 10 years ago, I played as Imperial Guard, so I have played it before. Although according to my achievements I never finished the game. Also I'm now playing on hard difficulty, which turns out is actually a massive deal as we'll get to. So here we are starting off as the Eldar. The gameplay is essentially a lot like Company of Heroes 2, which I played somewhat recently, so I got into it pretty easily and generally knew what was going on. The big difference is that it's more like a series of combat challenges than a usual RTS because there's just a finite amount of resources on the map, and a finite amount of enemies usually as well. And the challenge is, can you get through the gauntlet they've provided, without losing too many things for it to become impossible. To help out we have various magical abilities, like the one used there to burn some enemies out of a bunker. We're also getting killed quite a lot here, and that's going to be due to the difficulty, but we'll discuss that later. You do have regenerating health on the heroes. It just regenerates kind of slowly, at the start at least, so we're going to do some waiting around that we can fortunately cut out to get some health back. We soon come across a webway portal, so here we can pick up some resources and buy units. But every time we lose a guy, that's a permanent loss, you can't necessarily get the resources back to rehire them, so you just have to be careful and that's the challenge of the game. Perhaps in the lore, the Eldar are the best faction to explain why we can randomly recruit units in the middle of this orc forest we appear to be walking around in, because we were once an ancient empire that put these teleportation things all over the place and there was one here. Now here's a great exploit that I'll be using throughout the game. Our sniper hero has longer range and line of sight than a lot of things in the game, and because the enemies on the map tend not to aggro if they can't see you, you can kill them while they're just asleep for all intents and purposes. So here we cut down this heavy machine gun orc crew, avoiding any risk of losing resources, so this is the optimal way to play. And for extra satisfaction there's actually a dialogue that triggers afterwards telling me to watch out for that crew, but aha, I've already killed them. So there we go, we have beat the game at its own game already and we'll be able to do that throughout the campaign, but for the most part we'll be cutting out me sitting there gradually sniping every enemy on the edge of my line of sight, because while it's quite good to do in terms of gameplay, it's a beneficial thing to do, it's not the best thing to talk about or really the best game design overall. Here I am doing it again just for fun, taking out the bigger orcs before I bother to advance. That same guy, the sniper, once he builds up enough energy to take a grenade out of his pocket, can throw the grenade here over a wall to get some kills, again for free, sort of outside the enemy's line of sight I guess, they might be scripted to just sit there since we were so close to them as a tutorial for how to throw a grenade. Then they'll come out and we'll shoot them, so any time that enemies do aggro, everybody else will just be ready to fire, that's the Eldar's thing really, we have weak but theoretically powerful long ranged infantry, and we have these machine gun platforms you can see here that I'll be using quite a lot as well. In this next segment, we just had to defend this general area, and while I do so I'll mention a couple of other things. This game doesn't have WASD camera movement, one of the annoying things about games from the past. But the reason for that is there's a load of micro that's going onto your left hand essentially in the game design. So your right hand handles the camera, you can either move the mouse to the edge of the screen, the classic, or you can do what I'm trying to do here I think, which is hold the middle mouse button down while moving the mouse to sort of scroll it around. This allows you to select your units with your left hand and select their abilities, and you want to spam the abilities as much as possible. 
You might note there that our main faction hero, the Autark, almost instantly died when going into melee with the Orcs. That again is going to be part of the difficulty when playing on hard. Things are hard as it turns out, and I really didn't expect it to actually be hard, so that's why it's remarkable. In the end we cut our way through these enemies since this is the first level after all, but we're going to have to actually start paying attention to the difficulty level soon enough. We come to the end of the level and we have to fight this boss guy, just a gigantic orc. I think this might be the orc you play as if you pick the orcs as your faction. Once you kill him, there's a cutscene talking to some humans who showed up, and this is where the actual plot appears. I'll discuss it now, because I won't need to discuss it again in the future, essentially. The humans, the Imperial Guards Inquisition, are here to just blow up everything in this area of space, this star sector, or whatever they've organised it into. However, the Eldar are poking around here because there's some sort of cache of Eldar soul stones on one of the planets. Those are the things that hold their immortal souls and they need them to continue being immortal. They're basically elves, by the way, if you don't know Warhammer 40k lore. So we need to stop the humans from blowing everything up. But rather than stop the humans directly, we're going to work with them because the humans are only going to blow the place up because it's so corrupted by chaos. So we sort of agree to go and fight Chaos ourselves, we're going to try and assassinate the main Chaos guy in the area who's a corrupted space marine, and that might solve our plot. And as it happens, it lines up perfectly with the plots of the other campaigns, in particular the space marine one. Very convenient, although we won't be working with them directly of course, because the campaigns don't cross over like that, we're just going to be playing the stages that the space marines would have played instead. In between the missions, you can level up and equip your characters with things you find on the missions. I quite like this portion of the game because you can make some big differences to how your characters work using this, but I won't really be talking about it unless it's especially relevant. Essentially, I did some stuff. You can also choose whether to take from missions a reward in the form of equipment or in the form of unlocking new units to use. I started at the beginning of the game going down the path of getting as many units as possible. I think this might have been a mistake and I'll talk more about that later. For now, it's the second mission, and this is a mission that again is obviously supposed to be for space marines. We're fighting some corrupted imperial guards who are defending an area, but in our lore we have to go there because one of our teleport gates, the webway entrances, is in their base or something, so that's why we have to kill them. Even though we literally walked past a webway entrance in the last mission, we've forgotten about that by now, so now we're doing this. One of our heroes does die in this firefight here. That's not really a problem as it turns out, because your heroes can be rebought, and this is almost game-breakingly good for us, because it's essentially really cheap to rebuy a hero after they die. In fact, the most expensive possible hero rebuy is cheaper than the cheapest possible unit rebuy, and heroes are better. So, spamming heroes is quite a good idea, but I hadn't cottoned onto that quite yet. We're being chased by a big tank in this mission, the Bane Blade. Fortunately, it's not a real unit, it's kind of a scripted thing, so by not standing near it, it won't kill you effectively, but we'll come back to that. Here's a part of the mission where we could skip part of the progression if we used our hero to jump up this wall or our warp spiders to teleport up there. But the game disables the ability to jump or warp to certain points during missions. It seems they've carefully prevented you from dodging script triggers, although I'm sure there are places where you actually could if you really looked for it. We're taking out here a targeting cogitator as they're called, whatever that means. Essentially, we can convert enemy turrets to fight for us for a bit in this stage. And that's going to come in useful later on, so the turrets easily wipe out a bunch of enemies for us in that particular corner. We move over to the right side of the map where there are some stairs and the enemy's bane blade, for whatever reason, can't go up the stairs, there's always a weakness. And you can see here my main combat strategy, use our Autark Caliph to just sort of tank everything, while all the ranged infantry sits at the back, blasting into the fight, taking out enemies with the machine gun platform as well. This sort of works because Caliph has a lot of health and can tank stuff for a while. A bit later she'll get abilities that make her better at tanking. Combined with using our sniper to exploitatively advance, we soon reach the end of the stage. Here the Baneblade is sitting, and we have to run past it to reach a cogitator that will activate the turrets next to it and kill it for us. The only problem is that running past it causes it to kill us. 
and I didn't appear to make much effort to prevent that either. Well, we're going to run away, again, not making the maximum effort to run away. You can press X on the keyboard to sprint back to the nearest base and avoid some damage. We're doing it the slow way. This has the advantage that you can shoot while moving and you can choose where to move to. But in practice, I'm actually going back to the nearest base. And again, we just rebuy our lost hero for basically no money. And if you're looking closely here in this clip, you'll see that money isn't too much of an issue. Our money count is going up as we die. This is something I didn't realize until a long way into the game. But for whatever reason, when units die, you get some money, presumably, a part of their value comes back to you. So, what I mentioned earlier about it being a challenge to complete the level without running out of money is made a lot easier because you get money when units die. I don't know if you can completely rebuy your army with the profits you make from death in this fashion. In this case, I didn't try to find out because I thought I'll just take the survivors of that run through the enemy's explosive gauntlet and go for the cogitator in the top left of the map. This works out because the enemies guarding it weren't too strong and we're now out of the line of sight of the Baneblade. Caelith has an ability that shocks all of the nearby enemies in melee with a war scream or something, so they weren't doing too much to us. We take the thing, blow up the thing, and now we've done the thing. We go through a teleport and find ourselves in another town that's currently under attack by space marines. Our leader Caelith says something like, filthy humans better kill them. And so now we're fighting these guys here. I don't know why we haven't actually gone to fight Chaos as we originally planned, but maybe the teleports don't give you a choice about where they teleport you to. I don't know how the law works, but it seems like they do. The Empire is sufficiently organized for that. I discovered the machine gun platform can shoot through certain pieces of terrain, like the stairs I was just on to kill those enemy scouts. Very useful. And another handy thing in this mission is that the enemy are trying to blow up empty buildings for a law reason, I presume. So while they do that, you can set up and shoot at them like I'm doing right here, and they won't even aggro onto you. You can just kill them as they gradually machine gun a building to death. That works pretty well. Here we are a bit later. With some furious micro going on, I accidentally drove my transport tank here into the enemy. Now we're going to back it up. That thing allows you to rebuy dead units, or parts of dead units, I should say. If a unit loses a few models, they come out of the transport tank and rejoin it again in exchange for some money. So it's basically a mobile healing thing, sort of. It just doesn't heal the health of the models. We capture this area and then take a counterattack. I was frustrated here because I can't garrison this thing that looks like a building. The enemy had a couple of tanks coming in, but I'd built the Bright Lance platform, a version of the machine gun platform that works against tanks, so we take them down. Meanwhile, my actual machine gun platform is getting killed up at the front, but its crew are being re-recruited from our nearby transport as they die, so we're sort of hanging on despite taking massive damage here and it's all working out. Then I jumped Kalith right to the back to just be a tank, she basically dies back there, but again, it's better to have her take all of that, that damage because it's easier to rebuy the unit and the health lost just because of the economy. It's way cheaper to do it for some reason. And the cost to do so goes down, as you can see in the top right, if you don't do it right away. And here we don't really need to, so fine, we'll take the cheaper rebuy later. Overall, heroes appear to be the way to go, and that's going to be something I gradually work out as we play more and more. We now need to attack the Space Marines main base here for some reason. This proves a bit more difficult because fighting the Space Marines, well, it's hard. They're supposed to be the overpowered unit in this universe, and they're quite hard to kill. They're also very meanly not aggroing onto my heroes quite so much. They're actually shooting some of my squishy regular Eldar, and then those assault troopers just jump into the mix. You can see we're absolutely blasting them with tons of machine guns from all over, doesn't really do anything because her attacks, despite in the tooltip saying they're supposed to be a high damage, low defense unit, are actually not very high damage at all. We go on to attack the Space Marine main building. As I do so, they hit me with these drop pods, some Terminators come out. These are the even more overpowered versions of Space Marines. They're instantly taking down the soldiers they encounter. However, we're holding them off with sheer rebuying. Every time they kill some of my regular Eldar soldiers, they're immediately being re-recruited out of the transport sitting next to them, forcing the Terminators to stay in the same melee the whole time. They couldn't move on because they had to keep re-killing my infinite human wave attack, or Eldar wave attack, I should say. 
and eventually the other troops took them down. So there you go, there's a good tactic. Just throw numbers at them. Not a very law appropriate tactic for the Eldar, but this isn't a very law friendly game, I suppose. They also hit us with this Dreadnought, but a bit of quick micro shows the advantage of not using WASD for camera movement. I was able to use my left hand to sneakily order a haywire grenade to be thrown at that guy without having to do anything special with the mouse so it's very quick, and the Dreadnought was disabled and then taken out later pretty easily. Now it turns out, our next teleportation destination still isn't anything to do with our main mission. We've now teleported into an optional mission on the campaign map, the galaxy map. You don't have to do this, but I decided to do this to just to get experience points and stuff, essentially, to make things easier. We're going to take out some orcs somewhere. It was in this stage that the difficulty level began to really have an effect on things. You can see here we've already lost one hero to these two orc squads, and we're going to very quickly lose another, but I got out of the way just in time. I thought my heroes could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy infantry units, and while the Storm Boys are a good infantry unit, the one we're facing here, it's actually because of the difficulty level that you can't really do this. Somebody on Steam had done some experiments by the looks of things, and they said that having the difficulty on hard gives the enemy 25% extra health, but more interestingly, 300% extra damage. So essentially we're taking triple damage from stuff, and that's why our heroes can't beat enemy regular infantry units. We have the same problem just a little bit later against the next encounter where a couple of orcs corner our main hero, the Ortark, and absolutely annihilate her even with all of our other guys also there helping out. We just barely survive this one and popping a heal mid-fight as well. Dangerous stuff. We need to be quite careful. This difficulty scaling is out of control I thought at first. But we'll see later that tripling damage isn't that much of a problem actually sometimes, you just have to get used to it, and over time we'll see what I mean by that. If you were looking closely there, you would have seen that the Orc Shooter Boys, who are supposed to be a terrible ranged unit, pretty much killed my Guardians in about 1-2 to two seconds of ranged combat. Essentially, having a regular infantry unit on the field is a really bad idea with this extreme enemy damage because anything squishy enough to die in a couple of hits will just die in one hit instantly and not get any of their damage off, and expensive things like the Guardians are no good, expensive relative to heroes that is, so basically using heroes is the way to go. Here was a test fight, I had Caliph fighting one almost dead slugger boy in melee, she doesn't have a melee weapon which does make that a slightly unfair fight, but we still did surprisingly badly. Well overall, Things are difficult, and we're going to skip the rest of the mission to see the end here. The most difficult part, we had to defend this base from an orc attack and stop the enemy's trucks from driving to a point behind us. But we are being bombarded by all sorts of things and just losing everything instantly. Luckily, we've got a recruitment building here, so we're constantly healing and re-recruiting as we're dying, and that's keeping us in the fight. Dodgy stuff and the micro required to fight this properly was not at my command basically, so it was chaotic and we lost things all the time. I still hadn't noticed by the way that losing units causes you to gain money, I just always looked down and noticed I somehow had some money and rebought units, but yes we're actually making a profit from our death and then instantly using that profit to re-recruit the units on auto re-recruit if the whole unit doesn't die. A bit weird, strange balancing, it saves me here though that's for sure. The enemy vehicles are actually getting through our lines now because Caliph has our only anti-vehicle weapon and she's dead at the moment. Luckily I re-buy her at the last second as the vehicles are moving to the corner of the map where they escape. We've already let two vehicles through, if another one gets through we fail the mission. Handily Caliph has an accessory that gives her plus 50% damage to vehicles and she's carrying the fusion gun and anti-vehicle weapon and she very quickly blows up those two trucks just before they reach the point that would have failed the mission for us. Meanwhile, not much is alive here of our force, but it doesn't need to be alive, we just scrape through, kill the last few orcs, and that was that. The optional mission is over, we got some experience points or something. Here's the real mission, we're going to attack a Chaos base and get to work trying to stop Chaos so they don't blow up our craft worlds, spirit stones or what have you. There's this little shrine early on in the mission that says it's going to spawn in Chaos enemies. I destroyed that right away thinking nothing of it, 
We're going to come back to the theme though of respawning enemies in a game where you're supposed to have a finite amount of enemies to kill, and look at that a bit later in this commentary, so remember all of this. In the meantime, let's blow everything up. There was this chaos energy barrier on the map, I don't really know what that was or what it's stopping me from doing. We blew up the nearby power generators which didn't get rid of it and well, I'm just mentioning that in case somebody knows what that even was, I guess it doesn't matter. Here's a look at our new combat strategy, stay as far back as possible, don't bring any guardian squads, instead I have brought a warp spider squad, this is the more expensive Eldar infantry, who have longer range and can teleport away if the enemy come into melee with you, so they're a bit more survivable, maybe, but as we're going to see, transitioning away from using infantry at all is probably the way to go, you can spend the money you would spend on infantry on increasing the stats of your heroes temporarily instead, so just spamming those instead of having units is better since if the heroes die you don't really lose much money at all, although that said I'm still not convinced you actually lose money in the grand scheme of things if regular units die, confused because surely it couldn't be that easy. We progress around towards the chaos portal that we need to destroy, here there was a minor threat, this dreadnought was in the way. Fortunately, our hero Caliph has the anti-armor fusion gun and the haywire grenade, so we just sort of turn the dreadnought off and take it down. Without Caliph there, we would actually be in trouble because everybody else can barely damage armor at all. Once we attack the portal, it starts spawning infinite supplies of blood letters to stop us, another moment when an infinite wave of enemies is coming our way, something to note for later. In this section I've put down some of the stationary turrets, the ones that cost the red money instead of the orange money, I think you get the red money for killing enemies. Useful for putting turrets down in a place where you know the enemy is going to be constantly walking past, but actually you can stop the enemy spawning as we see here, you can go out and take out the shrines that they're spawning from to make things a bit easier. While I was doing the second set of shrines, some kind of magical thing is happening at the portal and blowing absolutely everything up. That's severely limiting the damage we're doing to the portal, but again we're standing next to our own recruitment building, so every time these warp spiders die they're instantly re-recruited and then just keep shooting and gradually take the thing down. Then all you have to do is go back to the bottom left of the map where we had a webway gate to leave the planet, on the way doing a bit of micro to dodge some grenade launching chaos cultists here, they come at us with a special enemy, the bloodletter thing, that I recognize from my recent game of Total War Warhammer 3 we had these guys in our army, well here they are in Warhammer 40k still going strong in the future or the past or however the two universes are supposed to be canon if they are at all. Luckily we've got this wraith lord now in our force essentially our giant special armoured thing, which annihilates their special giant armoured thing, and then we go on to annihilate a whole bunch of other things, including these noise marines with this sound flamethrower that appears to not do anything against the Wraith Lord, so we just stomp them to pieces instantly. Thus we escape, or do we? There was an optional mission to stay on this planet and fight a nearby Imperial Guard base for no other reason than to get some experience points I guess, so I thought might as well level up by killing these guys. Again I wonder if this mission makes more sense in some of the other campaigns, there's more of a reason for this to be happening. Maybe it's not even an optional mission in other campaigns, I don't know how they've mixed and matched that. Well there is one thing to deal with in this campaign, they have these manticore multiple rocket launchers that will occasionally blow you to pieces, however we can skip a tiny part of the stage here by using Caliph's jump to get up in front of the manticore over the cliff and then use a haywire grenade to take it out. You're supposed to go over to the east and open a gate and then come up to it while being shot by it. So this is the easier option. You can see the Imperial Guard troops nearby are shooting Caliph, but it's doing roughly nothing, the opposite of the difficulty we had earlier. It turns out that even on triple damage, Imperial Guard troops are so bad that you can barely see any pixels of even a single character's health going down while being attacked by multiple units, so very much the opposite experience to fighting Space Marines or Orcs. These guys just straight up suck and tripling a low number just gives you a bigger low number, so it's still fine. There's this sneaky part later on where you charge into this vehicle yard, capture the place, one of your teleports, that for some reason happens to be in the middle of this Imperial Guard vehicle yard, I guess they didn't decide to remove it when they were putting this place up, and out come a bunch of guys and they sneakily go inside the tanks and activate them. That's a problem because we still lack anti-tank capability apart from Caliph, so now she's killing one of the tanks in the corner and the other tanks are killing us. 
However, thanks to them forgetting to take down our webway portal, it not only constantly restores our health but can auto re-recruit losses. We do take a bit of a pounding and one of our characters basically dies, but it's fine in the end. And then we go on to have a very long sequence at this set of stairs. I've recruited these Wraith Guard, a heavy infantry unit, and we're just going to stand here in this choke point. I spent a while going off to the left finding enemies and making them come over to these stairs so I could kill them and lock them down with the heavy machine gun platform. Doing the same thing here but a bit later when I was trying to get enemies from the top of this area to come to the bottom and get shot in a similar way. There were absolutely loads of things here and every time you move forward it triggered more things to spawn but that stopped and we eventually killed them all suffice to say. Here was a tank ambush where the advantage of that left hand micro comes into play. We very quickly haywire grenade the first tank and it blocks the path of the second tank and now it's going to go down. Really useful to be able to instantly do quite complicated things on the left hand. For some reason, I found it easy to do, even though usually I can never do that sort of thing. I guess it's just set up in a quite simple way. Here I am actually getting hit by the manticores for once. They don't do that much, and for some reason, while they appear to be firing rockets, it's lasers that shoot down from the sky that do the damage. I'm guessing they <laughs> reused some kind of other particle effect for this. Well, Kaelith goes forward with her energy shield activated, which just tanks all of the enemy's damage, not that they were doing very much, blows up the manticore and now we can keep going. Here's another cheeky move with the old left hand micro. We can quickly throw out a grenade into this juicy block of Imperial Guard troops and down the disgusting humans go. And I suppose the only reason we're here is because we hate humans, we're just going to kill them, it's just an Eldar thing I think. We end up at the final section of the map where there is a boss tank that appears. So again, we're going to have to rely on Kaelith to do all of the damage here and micro her to stop her firing at the nearby infantry. The infantry luckily are being suppressed by the machine gun platform so they can barely walk towards us. We get the warp spiders to fire on them and then just hope that we can bring down the tank. Turns out that we can, it doesn't have the power to kill us in the meantime, even with that triple damage so it seems we're fine. Overall, the Imperial Guard suck. But we're going to see a bit more of them now, because for reasons I don't understand even slightly, and I don't think it even in the game as far as I can tell, we now have to attack another Imperial Guard base. I presume the rough idea was that because we're supposed to be defeating Chaos, we're going to go around and kill all of the humans who might be corrupted by Chaos. I feel like we're supposed to be going after the main Chaos guy, but we've forgotten about that after our brief mission against Chaos earlier. Well, now we're doing this. I just wanted to say at this point in the campaign that it was getting to the stage when I thought this kind of sucks. What we've got is a game where it doesn't really have a plot to justify these things happening. And the gameplay isn't anything particularly unique or special either. We've effectively got the worst of both worlds. We don't have the open world strategy, if you like, of getting to decide what missions we do and why we do them and go after certain targets like in a more grand strategy like strategy game. Instead it's just sort of an RTS gauntlet where there are just loads of enemies and you just have encounter after encounter for whatever reason and you have to do them. Which might be fine, but the game mechanics kind of give this a meaningless feel I think, especially in the absence of plot. Because since you can always bounce back and force your way through situations, even this one where I'm getting absolutely annihilated, you don't really have a challenge. It's like, what are we doing here? What are we trying to overcome? There's this Imperial base with a huge queue of enemies for us to work our way through. I don't really know why we're killing them, but I do know I will kill them eventually. I don't even have to do anything particularly good to kill them. The fun is supposed to be here in coming up with ways to kill them using all of your various abilities and units. And I suppose you replay each set of missions with the different factions and maybe do it in a slightly different way. But as mentioned, it all gives me this very empty feeling. I feel like I don't really need to be doing this from a gameplay perspective. We're getting auto-resolve vibes essentially here. All of the missions are ones where you're virtually guaranteed to win and there are no consequences for taking any losses. So I'm sort of thinking about this from a grander strategy player's perspective where it's like, okay, if all of these engagements we're guaranteed to win, it doesn't matter how many casualties we take and we might not take any, why do we have to do this at all? Because I'm thinking at the next layer above this about the overall mission to stop chaos we're supposed to have. So I feel like there needs to be in-stage plots or stages specific to 
what your faction's plot is, or have these sort of pointless stages, but you're picking which ones to do and getting various things as a result of doing them that might contribute to something and allow you to weave your own path through the game's available stages in some strategic way. We're back at it again with the wishing the game was better commentary. Well, this was just the stage in the game where it started to become obvious that this isn't really going anywhere. The fun you're supposed to have is just coming up with ways to get through the minutiae of the various stages, like sniping guys out of a bunker you saw me doing earlier here, and here we're trying to fight around a corner in a slightly annoying way and I can use a few abilities to make it easier. It's just these moment-to-moment -moment gameplay things that are the fun of the game. But I came in here, for whatever reason, expecting something a bit more meta on top of that to also be going on, so you'd have to get through these combat challenges and you'd be eager to get through them with minimal casualties or inflicting ma maximal casualties on the enemy because there would be a reason to be doing that, such as you might have to fight them later, you need to keep your things alive for later, there's some manpower system, I don't know, other mechanics that mean you need to do well, especially as the Eldar, where I think the lore is that their species is dying, they can't reproduce very well or something, and that Eldar lives are supposed to be precious, there's not really much in the game that indicates that, in fact, why are the Eldar bothering to fight on the front line at all if that is the case? Well, who knows. So I took a brief break there from the actual commentary for a rant, because that essentially summarizes the rest of the game. What we've seen so far, just going through stages, killing things, that's the entire game. You just go through stages and kill things. Sometimes there's a reason for the stage to be happening, sometimes there isn't. So effectively, let's just complain about the lack of reasons for the rest of the stages as we go through for our own amusement. And by the way, I decided to look at this one random clip here in the stage where we lost our tank. And I actually looked at the numbers in the bottom right before and after the tank died to finally settle this question. Do you get all of the resources back when something dies? The answer, yes you do. So it is as I feared actually. I thought at least you might only get part of them back so there was some reason to not lose the units. That said, we can see right here, you don't get resources when your hero goes down. That's because they're not technically dead, but you do have to pay some resources eventually to re-recruit them and bring them back to life. That means there is a potential long-term drain on your resources if your heroes keep dying in combat. Although that that said, the next level of that said, there is a way to get your heroes back without rebuying them, which I hadn't discovered at this point in the campaign, so we'll talk about that later. So there is a way to have infinite losses for free if you play things a little bit more carefully. Here we're having some trouble at the very end of the stage with some tanks that are blowing us to pieces, and this is rocket bombardment as well. And we're gradually having to work through them using just Caliph effectively because I still haven't come up with a way to bring out anti-armor weapons. We could just recruit a machine gun turret and upgrade it to the Bright Lance turret, but for whatever reason, I can't be bothered, so I'm just doing this insane micro to somehow get through this. There's a shortcut scene that explains that indeed these Imperial Guard were corrupted by chaos. We found a transmission where they were talking to the guy who said, yes, kill everybody, it's all good for us. Didn't come up with any plot reason though, I think what they could have done there is throw in some kind of coordinates or something where the reason we had to take that base and find this transmission was it had the location of the secret chaos thing, you know, the drill, but in this case it was just explaining that post hoc there was a reason for us to kill them, although not in the grand sense. We then stay on the same planet because there was another optional mission I decided to do for the XP, we're going to take out an orc base as well, which happens to be around. And in this mission, we've reached the point when our heroes are so powerful, they can do basically anything the game has to throw at us. I'm going to focus all of my resources on just upgrading the heroes rather than buying units and not bring any support units. We've got loads of good equipment as well because our sniper has a really good weapon and can now do this no cooldown kinetic shot that makes his rounds effectively explosive if you press a button to make it so. So a bit more micro, but way more powerful. Elenwe the healer has a magical staff that allows her to shoot a really long range magical attack as well, and that's automatic. Plus, the sniper's weapon has this perk where it confuses units that get hit by it. That's that red thing you can see on the orcs there. 
which means they don't fire back at you for a few seconds, and the explosive effect of that kinetic bolt thing makes them get suppressed. There's no cooldown, it's costing his energy, his mana effectively to do it, but that just comes back after the fight. So the game has now become, select the sniper, press W to activate kinetic shot, and then click on an enemy unit, and then you just switch between pressing W and clicking until you've blown up all of the enemies, they're just being juggled by the explosive effect, and it's generally absolutely fine. Now during this stage I discovered something, or started thinking about something I should say, that I hinted at earlier, which I'll now talk about for a bit instead of the actual gameplay because it doesn't matter so much anymore. They had this teleporter machine, and every time you did some damage to it, it would bring in some more enemies to fight, and it made me think, well are we actually getting experience points by killing these enemies? Because you do level up your characters and get skill points, so it's a good idea to kill as many enemies as early in the game as possible for that reason. And I started thinking, can I just sit back here, set up some defenses, and make the enemy infinitely spawn units at me so I can keep killing them and grind XP? Also, enemies will very occasionally drop items. I didn't really realize that at first, but that's another reason why you could grind through enemies to get stuff. Well, I did it a little bit here just to see what would happen. Since I did need to set up defenses here anyway for the mission objective, they're going to counterattack this place once I capture it. This early experiment doesn't really bring any results because you can't see your character's experience in the battles, although they definitely do gain experience from killing enemies because you occasionally see the level up thing come over their head as they kill enemies. So it can be done, it's just not obvious whether it's economical to be doing it. I only did it for like 10 minutes here and then got bored because I didn't know if anything good was happening really, but I did then try some more serious experiments which we'll talk about in a bit. Despite my complaints about things being easy, we actually almost lost at this stage in the mission. You had to defend some power generators. We were down to the last one, and it was down to its last tiny bit of health when we finally completed this part of the mission. It's because with the enemy's triple damage, an objective like defend a building is going to actually be three times as hard because they're going to kill it super fast. The next time we had to do it, later in the mission, I set up tons of our stationary cannons, and I realized you can upgrade the machine gun versions to the Bright Lance version and something called the D-Cannon, which is just a giant laser thing that appears to be really good. So we annihilated the enemy and took minimal damage, completing all that just fine. The mission then ends with this boss battle. I had expected there to be a tank at the end because some of the dialogue was talking about a tank in some way. So I'd set up in the corner with some Bright Lances, ready to immediately get some anti-vehicle action. However, as we start shooting and I smugly sit here ready to win, the enemy's health isn't going down at all and they're just killing me. That's because this is actually a gimmick boss of sorts. There are some sort of blue barrels of explosives sitting around. We have to try and kite the tank into touching them. And helping out with that, it will occasionally pick one of your heroes and charge at them. So we just stand in the appropriate place. Try not to die to the orc reinforcements, which is easy enough by spamming heals all the time. And boom, we can force the tank to kill itself. It does also run us over as well, but that doesn't really matter. So we run around doing that, and I think I'll mention here that the best thing about this game is everything that the orcs say. I know it's been said before about Warhammer, but the orcs appear to just be delightfully stupid, but they're also right about everything, and that combination is amazing. So we go on to do that, and now the actual story mission. It says here something about looking for the source. And I thought they meant the source of the transmission from that other thing, which might actually validate doing it in the way I suggested, but it doesn't quite appear to be that. We go into this kind of arena full of Eldar, as it turns out. They offer to help us at first, and then we start fighting. And I think what we've got here is a case of, here's a mission from another campaign that we have to do as the Eldar. So just for some reason, we're fighting the Eldar. The given reason is that these Eldar have, have prophesied that we're going to fail and destroy the system as a result. So now they need to kill us, but we've prophesied that we need to just not fail, so we're going to kill them instead. And now we're all fighting all across the map. The important thing about this mission, though, is that it had another case of infinitely spawning enemies. You can see we've got this secondary objective on the left there to destroy the hidden webway gate. If you don't do that, said gate constantly throws Eldar Guardians and those Wraith Lords at you forever, as it turns out. And after cutting onto this, I thought I'm actually going to set up and try to grind for XP properly this time, because there was a pretty good setup potential at least here. 
There's this base that's somewhat near the spawn point for the enemies, and the base will constantly heal us if we do take any damage. The issue was that it was too far away, and the Wraith Lords didn't aggro and walk towards us. So after some moving around, I eventually came up with this setup. We've got our Bright Lance Cannons who can shoot the Wraith Lord at its spawn point, so that guarantees it's going to aggro. And we've got our Sniper and everything else can easily deal with the terrible Eldar Guardians. So that was that. I did notice they were still managing to attack me, so after some more shenanigans, we've got this superior arrangement where, for some reason, we're able to attack the Wraith Lords without them aggroing. We're right on the edge of their line of sight or something, but we're still able to fire at them. So, we now have a way to infinitely kill Wraith Lords over and over again. Here's a cut to an hour or two later after I just left the game running and came back. We've probably got some experience on our heroes or something, who knows. The heroes aren't doing anything, but you do share experience between them, I think, or between units, because I have seen them level up without actually doing anything in a stage. The little pop-up appears above their head. But more importantly, perhaps, we get the randomly dropped items, and the items are both potentially useful, and you can swap items for experience in your loadout by deleting the items. So we can get experience that way guaranteed at the very least. We also see there's a huge pile of Wraith Lord corpses on top of each other. So it's all working. What I did, because that was at night, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to leave the game on overnight and come back to see how much loot I get. But you can see I was foiled by some good old fashioned always online DRM. At some point the internet went out during the night and the game paused to tell me about it, so I don't know how much grind I actually got out of my like 8 hour session of leaving the PC on, but probably not that much. A few items are on the ground so we can pick those up at least. I don't know how much experience we got, but I remember when I came back I actually saw one of the level ups happen by random chance. So you do definitely get experience for just standing here even if you're not participating in the fight. The weapons that dropped we're actually pretty good, we're going to use a lot of the stuff there, and there were some good things that I don't really want that I can swap for big experience later. Now here's the next stage of my experiments, I decided to turn the graphics off, try to run the game in a window, and have it run in the background while I did my daily stuff. It turns out though this game pauses if it's ever not the active window, and I couldn't find a way to do anything about that. So you can't passively grind the game in the background while doing something else. It also barely reduces its CPU and GPU usage to turn the graphics to minimum, so that's a shame. I actually did get a few items in that fashion by eating lunch and then coming back and finding a couple of items. That all suggests that my actual big grinding session at night probably only lasted about an hour or two, which is a shame. Well, we eventually walk forwards and blow up the webway gate. The dream is over. We found that in principle, this grinding thing works. It's a little bit difficult to get it to keep working over time. It's also really pointless, but we'll get to that later. Here's the thing we're actually supposed to be doing. We need to take out the Seer Council who are doing a ritual here in the corner of the map. You can attack them from outside of their aggro range, so we can sit here and gradually kill them. I made a mistake though, I eventually got bored of doing this and approached them. This triggers an event though where some warp spiders show up and ferry them away somewhere else, so I should have just kept shooting. They teleport to another part of the map and you just have to hunt them down and some more enemies spawn to fight. And we go through that just fine and then I don't make the mistake this time, I make sure not to approach the new ritual site and just snipe away, eventually they die and that's that. That's the annoying Eldar out of the way. As for the grinding results, the experience gained from fighting wasn't that good. Most people got a level up, but I think one of our characters didn't. So it wasn't even that much experience gain. But we have so much surplus equipment now, we can convert it into experience points by donating it to the craft world. And I used that to get to nearly max level. And I was like, well, that's very special to be at such a high level here. Because I thought there was quite a lot of the game left, we're actually relatively near the end of the game as it turns out, it's a shorter game than I thought. So this didn't really matter, I don't recommend bothering to grind, maybe on impossible difficulty it makes more sense because you need the little bits of extra stats you get from the gear more. Who knows, let's go right on to the next mission. We're still in the same place as the last mission because it turns out that the guy we need to kill was actually here. 
However, he reveals that when we took out the Eldar Seers, they were performing a ritual that was stopping the Exterminatus by stopping him from guiding the Exterminatus fleet. So essentially, by fighting the Eldar, we have now caused the Exterminatus. We were trying to prevent. It's all going very well. The other Eldar were actually the good guys. We just killed them. We were confused about why Chaos would want the Exterminators to happen. It's because they want skulls for the Skull Throne and stuff. They don't care if the Chaos army dies because everyone else dies when the Exterminators fleet shows up. As it happens, it shows up about two minutes later, so they were pretty close by. The ritual was just barely hanging on. The thing is, the Exterminators is quite a slow process, fortunately, as it turns out. They start blowing the planet up, but then they stop for a bit and our guys are still alive. So we have the opportunity to leave, we just have to go through this stage that has a webway at the end, but also has a time limit, so that's the gimmick. And this again does add some actual challenge, I think this is more like it. Having a time limit to go through these gauntlets does mean you want to play optimally in that playing fast is explicitly rewarded. There's a different section though towards the end of this gauntlet where the time limit goes away for a bit and you have to kill a bunch of enemies to summon a Chaos Champion and then kill that champion. The enemies actually kept spawning while I was fighting the champion and I almost got completely wiped out until I realized that if I stand slightly outside of the arena, all of the enemies coming in from the edges stopped spawning or maybe they just ran out of things to spawn and we could attack the boss without aggroing him. So once again, <laughs> added again with the long range exploits. However, after killing him, the time limit does come back and I wonder whether the time limit was secretly still ticking down while it wasn't on the screen and we were fighting that boss the slow and stupid way. Well, we do escape in time and then the Imperium nukes the planet. I don't know why they didn't do this to begin with. They wasted their time going around shooting everything with lasers for a bit, then just nuked the entire thing. Fortunately, that gives us time to escape and that's that. Turns out though that I don't really know how these webway gates work because we escaped to a seemingly random location and in another lore twisting effect, some humans came through the gate with us. So the Inquisition are here at this place we've ended up on a abandoned spaceship somewhere in space. Curiously, the Inquisitor is here. So the Exterminatus doesn't even warn the Inquisition themselves that they're about to blow the planet up and give them the chance to leave, for example. I also didn't think humans could use the Eldar webway gates, apparently they came through with us to this location, and I thought the gates went to other gates. It seems they can just shoot you to random places, so we're now on this spaceship. They now have a discussion, the characters, because technically the plot is over. Our objective was to save that planet and the soul stones within it. Well, the planet just blew up, so now what do we do? After our discussion, we eventually come to this conclusion. There is one more soul stone we could save because the main chaos guy has one of our soul stones that he captured as a prize because it was the soul stone of one of our high ranking officers. So we could go and get that back. It's argued that we're going to lose tons more soul stones just to get that one soul stone back. But then it is counter argued that there is a prophecy that if that one soul stone in particular is not recovered, the Necrons, a force from outside of the plot, will come and destroy all of Eldarkind. So altogether, there's a reason for us to play the rest of the game stages as it turns out. So for this stage, we just have to walk through this spaceship killing orcs to find this webway gate. There was a boss at the end though. As I fought the boss, the sound stopped working for some reason, and then the game crashed to desktop, which was pretty annoying. So I replayed this stage with Cheat Engine active. This allows you to activate God Mode and reduce the health on enemies. So I could just attack move through the entire stage, absolutely annihilating everything, which isn't too different to how the stage actually went. Just sending a few heroes through is fine to take out most enemies at this stage because we're nice and overpowered even more so than usual thanks to that little bit of grinding that might have helped. With that done, we can use the gates to jump to some more useful locations. There's Chaos's main base where we might be able to find that soul stone. There was another option though that caught my eye. I wasn't that interested in doing the optional missions anymore, but this one seemed relevant. We can go back to the planet that was just blown up because it wasn't completely blown up and some of the Eldar who somehow survived being blown up are still there and they have found the Avatar Chamber, a special part of the hidden craft world that if captured could allow us to summon our gigantic super unit, the Avatar of Cain. 
I thought that sounded good, so we'll come here and try to get access to it. However, again, because this is a mission that presumably was for some other faction to fight these Eldar for a different reason. The Eldar are not going to work with us, they're going to try and stop us getting the Avatar of Cain. Which may make sense from their perspective because we are the evil Eldar in this context because we actually caused this apocalypse right here just earlier. Well, we are back to make it a bit worse by also killing all of the Eldar survivors. Not very in keeping with Eldar lore, I think, but who knows. We'll kill them all and see if we can steal their secret powers. To make things worse, the Eldar are actually trying to leave in the face of our onslaught. Well, we can't allow that, so there's a time limit to kill them all. And the time limit can be extended by blowing up the webway gates, so it's harder for them to leave. Again, this really doesn't feel like the sort of thing we should be doing while playing as the Eldar, but I guess this is an optional mission, so it's a bit less breaking for the canon for us to be doing this. We could have played the game without any of this technically happening. Oh well, I wanted the experience points and the special unit, so let's keep going. After killing our way to the middle of the map, we find a survivor, and it turns out that our sniper knows who this person is because they used to be fighting together, possibly in the earlier Dawn of War games or something. I think this might be a reference to stuff. He requests that we stand down the war host and don't slaughter them after realizing he knows who she is, but we've already killed them all, it's too late. Now, it's mentioned that they had a prophecy to stop us, but we had a prophecy to stop them, and she is eventually convinced that our prophecy is better because she wants to stop the Necrons. So she agrees to help us in our mission, and we sacrifice her, as it says, to create the Avatar of Cain using this Avatar Chamber. What that is isn't explicitly shown, but here we go, we've created this thing, and we're going to be able to use it in the next mission. What I don't know is, if you don't do that optional mission, whether you still get that for the next main mission. Because at the start of the main mission, we have a cutscene of the Avatar of Cain blowing up a giant tank. Maybe the tank is a boss or something if you don't have it. Well, here we are in Chaos's big base. This is where they've gathered all their stuff and the various different factions, the regular Chaos, the corrupted Imperial Guard and the corrupted Space Marines are all here. So we just have to take all of them out. Here's a nice use of the ward ability on our summoner, Lenwe, our fire seer, I should say. We've got the upgraded version of the ward spell that reflects damage, so by deliberately standing in the enemy's line of sight while sniping them out of windows there, it does more damage because their fire is bounced back onto them, and all of the magic used to do it recharges by the time it's done. Check out how fast we kill this enemy tank, that's because of Caliph's ridiculously powerful stats at this stage. We've bought the attack upgrade for this mission and she has a high level fusion gun that does more damage the closer you are to the enemy and she has the accessory that gives her plus 50% damage against vehicles. Essentially, all armored targets die immediately, infantry is the only real threat and that's not much of a threat when you can do the sniper antics as mentioned earlier. Here's a shot just to prove that we can actually lose health. It was getting to the stage when we were dominating the enemy so much, I wondered if the god mode activated earlier was still active even after cheat engine was closed. Well, it isn't. We are actually still getting killed by the enemy, but just barely. This is partially because Elenwe has multiple healing perks stacked on top of her that mean we constantly regenerate health when we're near her, and in most cases, that regeneration outpaces the damage you can take in standard combat, so it looks like we're never receiving any damage. Use the Avatar of Cain to annihilate the Space Marine Terminators there, and we go on to fight a boss where a big tank appears. This tank is easier to kill than that Orc tank, as it turns out, because it's a regular enemy that takes anti-armor damage. So we just pop a ward on Caelith and activate her energy shield as well. That's two different ways in which she can't receive damage now and some of the damage is being bounced back onto the tank. And she sits there gradually melting it with her fusion gun. Looks like some reinforcements tried to support but I'm very quick on the micro to annihilate them the second they deploy. And basically we're fine. We are a very long way from the hard difficulty I was complaining about earlier. We don't take triple damage, we pretty much take no damage and we're just annihilating everything, the boss goes right down, the space marines are toast, they're just as easy to kill as everything else at this stage. This takes us to the final level where it drops the facade of being about the Eldar at all 
and gives us this cutscene of the Space Marines doing the final level, with a voiceover from the Space Marine characters as well. I think there were actually some cutscenes earlier in the game where it also told it from the perspective of the Space Marines, and I just didn't really look at it in this commentary. It is their story, but here we are, somewhere amid the ruins of the final Chaos base where the big Chaos guy has transformed into a demon because he's so evil and such. In the corner, you might spot some Eldar eager to become the characters in this story at some point. So for this stage, we just have to run through another gauntlet killing Chaos enemies, and you had to destroy three things to make the Kairos Demon, the main boss of the game, become vulnerable. Here's a shot of Kalith just soloing everything. Our guys are supporting from a distance, but those enemy walkers go down pretty much instantly, and the infantry I just confuse all the time because of that confusion perk I mentioned on the sniper. Therefore, we're fine to run through this thing. As it happens, the Space Marines are already in the boss arena, fighting with the guy. So they're trying to win the game, but no, we're not going to let this be their story, because the Space Marines end up losing in this cutscene, and there's the guy we need to kill at the background there. He's kind of stuck in the ground, he's halfway born out of some lava or something, he's not fully done turning into a demon. So this is our chance to kill him, and indeed, he kills that guy, the Space Marine main character. So this is our chance to step in and make there be a new main character if we slip in here and cheekily kill the boss. Kindly, the boss left alive this gigantic Eldar headquarters next to the arena, so we can use this to heal and recruit things to send into the boss arena. Although we don't necessarily want to recruit things with our hero focus build, we capture it, and then I thought, can I just shoot into the arena with the sniper and not go in? I was desperate for some last exploits here, but it looks like you're not allowed to. He is kind of in range of the sniper by the looks of things. But he doesn't shoot over the edge of this cliff. I'm sure they worked out a way to stop you from shooting from here and not triggering the boss. We're going to play the game as intended and go down into his little crater. While we're here, we have to fight loads of respawning enemies. The boss can summon bloodletters and these gigantic bloodletter cav things come from behind you. The issue we have is that only Caliph can really fight the big ones, which keeps getting stuck in melee where the fusion gun doesn't work because they're just charging her down. And also, when you give an attack order with Kaelith, she runs at the enemy because the fusion gun is better at close range, I guess. So she ends up in melee quite a lot, where she does get owned. Because we're not doing our massive damage, they're doing their massive damage to us. So it takes a bit of micro to get through, and the boss itself has a few powerful attacks, like that one just there that wipes us out a bit. This is a good time to note the death revival exploit that I wanted to talk about earlier but forgot about. That is that when you pay to restore your guys back to health, you can avoid doing that if you have some sort of healing effect. The body of your hero on the ground is still alive but at zero health, so if something causes them to not have zero health, they get back up. For example, Alenwe has the healing spell. You can use that to revive somebody for free. I couldn't find any footage of me doing it. I definitely did it a load of times in the campaign. It seems I've edited them all out here and there throughout the runs. And I didn't use it here because I couldn't get close enough to the body in question. But you can do it, just take my word for it. There is a way to heal for free. And if you were to use that carefully, you could avoid ever losing anything as you took casualties. Another way to do it is with Caleb. Her jump attack, for some reason, heals allies nearby where it lands. So if you jump into a melee or something, I guess you can heal your allies. So you can jump on top of your fallen comrades to heal them in that fashion as well. I'm sure there are some other ways to get health. Maybe if you happen to die near one of your own buildings, it's pretty useful. You can see I tried to bring in some Howling Banshees for the first time in this campaign to enter the boss arena, and they just died. I don't even know why they died there. They just fell over and that was the end of that. Well, that serves me for trying to use a unit. Let's go back to business. Although I am also building turrets in the boss arena to constantly shoot at it for added cheekiness. We finally got into the groove of things when I set up this arrangement where a second attack group fights at the gate to the arena to stop the reinforcements coming in, and the heroes just micro around the boss's attacks and constantly deal damage. This did take quite a long time, like 15 minutes. This boss just has tons of health. I thought maybe there was something you could do to get its health down when I saw how big the number was. But no, you just have to shoot it a gajillion times and dodge the attacks as we did there. 
Once it's nearly dead, it says we need to use an Eldritch Storm to finish it off. I immediately do so, but I think I was too eager to do so because it doesn't count effectively, it doesn't do any more damage and the fight's still going, our guys have stopped fighting back here, I just remind them to finish off the enemy and there we go. And then it just sort of sits here awkwardly, I thought well have I completed the game, have I soft locked it, started trying to cast the Eldritch Storm thing again but I wasn't allowed to for some reason. And then it pops in saying what are you waiting for, why haven't you cast the storm yet, we cast it again, this time we get through, so I don't know why that was so hard. Well that's going to blow up the boss, the plot savvy among you might think though, wasn't our purpose for coming here to recover a thing that the boss has, so by blowing his head off and the body slipping into a pit of lava, might that damage the thing? Well, what's that on the floor? It's the thing, it was just there. <laughs> so that's convenient for everybody involved. We can pick up that and we've completed our mission. We saved at least one Eldar soul on our trip to this chaos infested sector. And let's ignore how many gajillions of Eldar souls we deliberately killed along the way. So this completes the game. We have a final cutscene. I should mention that the Soulstone we're recovering here is the sister of the sniper character, not that that especially matters but he mentions it here. I think the real treasure was the friends we made along the way or some such thing is discussed here. And then the sniper guy is going to take the Soulstone back to another craft world to fight the Necrons I guess or whatever they mentioned earlier. One of those webway gates just appears, if you can make them appear why did we spend half of the game trying to look for ones to go into, I don't know. And then the credits roll. It didn't feel like what story there was was particularly ended there, but I guess it wasn't particularly started either. Essentially, we completed what the game asked of us and it doesn't really matter why. We weren't the Space Marines, so don't worry about it. Everyone's dead except three or four Eldar and that's probably fine. We end up back on the main menu and that's that. So welcome to the end of this campaign commentary. I think I'll say overall that this game was a disappointment. I had played it before as mentioned and I remembered the Dawn of War 2 world a bit differently. For some reason I thought it was more involved, there was more to do and I thought there was more plot but I'm probably thinking about the original Dawn of War 2 which is more like that. Maybe I'll play that sometime, didn't feel like it after playing this. I thought this was the good one because it was the newest one or something, probably got tricked in some way. Seems like they really should have focused on making one campaign instead of six that are not especially different to each other. I guess they had to make all the different races for multiplayer so gave them all a campaign but not really because that's not worth the money and such. Well it seems like a shame. I did actually have some fun playing the campaign though. I did enjoy doing that grinding experimentation even though it was ultimately completely a waste of time. And I liked doing the little bits of micro to get through the stages in overpowered ways using all the various spells and stuff towards the end. But it was not particularly fulfilling because as mentioned before you don't really need to, there's no reward for playing well, there's not much punishment for playing poorly and the entire plot, the game world doesn't provide a context for why you're doing anything anyway so that makes it a little bit harder to be engaged with what's going on on the screen. Overall, I had fun pressing some of the buttons, but maybe I'll press some different buttons sometime that will do more for me. Good review, I think. Now, on a related note regarding my next campaign commentary, it's going to be for Company of Heroes using the Blitzkrieg mod, the realism mod, or vague realism anyway. And it's related because that game is essentially this game. They have the same gameplay and game engine, but Company of Heroes is World War II themed. That was another game I played before in the distant past and just sort of remembered while playing this. We're on some kind of nostalgia trip arc on the OVD Gaming Grounds channel here for some reason. So coming up next, the challenge will be, can I play the Company of Heroes campaign with a realism mod for which it is not at all designed to work with, where things like your units having very low health, very long range and good accuracy mean that many of the gauntlets in that game aren't necessarily inevitable conclusions like they are in this one. We're going to find out the hard way of course, so I'll tell you what happens next time I make a video.